Welcome to ILTV's Insider. I'm Steve Leibowitz. In recent days, Prime Minister Netanyahu reportedly rejected a U.S.-Egyptian-Qatari proposal that provided a pathway for an end to the war that would see Saudi Arabia normalize relations with Israel in exchange for Jerusalem agreeing to provide a pathway toward Palestinian statehood while ending the war in Gaza. The Prime Minister is saying that the goals of the war have not changed, destroying Hamas military capability, returning the hostages, and freedom of military action in Gaza to restore security. The carrot being offered from Washington is normalization with Saudi Arabia and most of the Arab world, and a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in one fell swoop. And then, potentially, a real alliance of U.S.-led anti-Iranian forces effectively a new Middle East. Sounds too good to be true. It also is too true, uh, too difficult for most Israelis to believe. There was a call between, a phone call between Biden and Netanyahu, and then a back and forth between the two leaders about whether such a deal could even be workable. Netanyahu's notion of a militarized, demilitarized Palestinian state was found to be intriguing by Biden and was not rejected in Washington. Netanyahu's coalition is not even tempted to go down this path with the right wing of the government favoring permanent IDF presence and the resettling of Gush Katif. Today we are joined by Zoom by two Israelis with the highest level of contacts in the Arab world. Dr. Gershon Baskin knows all of the main characters in the Palestinian Authority and Gaza, and Arya Lightstone, an advisor to former U.S. Ambassador David Friedman on the Abraham Accords. Arya, let me start with you, since I understand that you just visited the U.S. Embassy uh, earlier today. This could be the fulfillment of the Israeli diplomatic dream, no? A vision to end the war in Gaza and effectively end the conflict with the Arab world. Are the Saudis genuine and are the pieces in place to make it work? Color me skeptical. So it's possible, but it's just highly unlikely to be successful in that regard. And the reason is because you're trying to solve lots of different problems that may have similar characters involved, but they don't have the same incentives. And the same incentive structure will actually pull some of them further away than closer together. So, yes, everybody would like to end the war. Everybody wants the, Israel to accomplish its goals during the war. Everybody wants all of the hostages returned home safely and as healthy as they can possibly be at this moment and normalization throughout the region and the ability to stand up against Iran. All of those are true, factually. Will they be able to be accomplished by creating a pathway to a Palestinian state? To me, that smells a lot more like Oslo than it does Abraham. Oslo did not work. Abraham did. The path is there. It should be followed. All right. Dr. Baskin, what would you say to those who inevitably claim that the horrific Hamas attack on October 7th will ultimately be rewarded with the creation of a Palestinian state? It's the first thing that came to my mind when I heard about this plan. Well, I, I think there's a great deal of truth to that. I think that the, uh, a lot of what Arya said I agree with. Um, Oslo was a failure. One of the reasons why it was a failure was because it was so non-explicit in terms of its end game. For 30 years, people have been talking about a two-state solution, but it never appeared in any of the Oslo agreements. Six agreements were signed. None of them ever mentioned the creation of a Palestinian state. Yet everyone assumed that that would be its outcome. And after 30 years of talking about a two-state solution, I thought it was no longer viable. But here we have, after October 7th, it's, set, it's suddenly back on the agenda. Everyone's talking about it. And I think what it will probably emerge is we're going to see perhaps a number of leading OECD countries, perhaps even the United States, recognizing the state of Palestine even before there are Israeli-Palestinian negotiations on determining the border or the future of Jerusalem or the refugee issue. The world wants to see this conflict resolved and they believe that it's a two-state solution. And many people are beginning to understand that they need to remove the Israeli veto on the issue of Palestinian statehood from negotiations, create a fait accompli, and then have negotiations between two member states of the United Nations along lines that are very different than the lines of negotiations that took place between 
Israel and what he calls a disputed territory, what the rest of the world calls an occupied territory between a state and, and an organization. So it creates a different kind of balance and it would be a very strange victory for Hamas in a sense because Hamas has never supported a two-state solution and yet this might be the outcome of its attack against Israel. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. All right, let, let me come back to you, Arya. According to the Wall Street Journal, U.S. intelligence is saying that only 30% of the Hamas fighting force has been killed until now. Even if the war goes on for more months, Hamas gunmen are likely to be around. From what you can tell, who is the U.S. expecting to act to keep Hamas out of power in Gaza? and in Judea and Samaria, for that matter. Yeah, well, you can eradicate an ideology, and part of the purpose of that is actually trying to be explicit in what we actually demand from partners, whoever they might be. And the, the uh, bigotry of low expectations, which we've repeatedly given to various different friends or potential friends in the region, the Palestinian Authority may be chief amongst them, that you can still, you know, have pay to slay and all these other things and we're going to look away because we can't do better is really embarrassing in terms of how we would want to treat the Palestinian people. It's not how we would want Americans to be treated or Israelis to be treated or anybody else. If we raise the bar, people will achieve that bar. If we keep the bar low, then people will, shockingly enough, uh, meet those low expectations. So, yes, will you be able to eliminate all of Hamas? The answer is absolutely not. Will you be able to kill every last gunman? The answer to that is also not. The question is, can the ideology of Hamas grow in Gaza and be able to act like they acted? Will they be able to influence like they influence? And will it be able to spread to the West Bank, Judea and Samaria and to other places in the region? If the answer to that is yes, then Israel will not, will not have succeeded in its war. If the answer to that is no, Israel will actually have wildly been successful, something that very few other countries have been able to do, which is to mitigate a, a radical terror uh, entity on its own border. All right, Gershon, let me come back to you. The Palestinian Authority must love the plan, right? They get statehood without having to fight or negotiate. The question is, can they or any other authority rule in Gaza if Hamas is still around with gunmen? No, listen, Steve, the Palestinian people have to go to elections. They need to elect a new authority, a new government that legitimately represents the people. The Palestinians need to also either be forced or by their own will incorporate into their election law a stipulation that says political parties can participate in elections only if they reject the armed struggle. Any parties that support the armed struggle should not be allowed to participate in those elections. Democracies have a right to protect themselves. Palestinians, most Palestinians, have a desire to live in a democratic state, and they want to choose their leaders. They haven't been able to do that in 18 years. So we need a reformed Palestinian Authority, a Palestinian government. The Palestinian people need a reform Palestinian government that represents them. It must be a government of, his, of West Bank and Gaza, and there must be rules to the game. I agree totally with Arya. We have to raise the bar. We have to insist that when we begin a new peace process, that we deal with issues like education, what we're teaching our children. And both sides need to do that. And we need to do that in parallel. Not that we're checking each other and verifying each other's 
curriculum, but we need to do that each on our own with agreed upon criteria. I think this is a central building block for a peace process. Now, I don't think anyone is suggesting that tomorrow there's going to be a Palestinian state and that there will be a border recognized between Israel and Palestine and will manage the future of Jerusalem and economic issues and everything else. There will have to be a negotiation. It should be a regional negotiation. It should involve our partners in Egypt and Jordan and the Emirates and Bahrain and Morocco and Saudi Arabia. There'll be no reconstruction of Gaza if the Palestinians are not directly involved in the governance of Gaza. There'll be no foreign troops there who will enter Gaza unless the Palestinians themselves take the lead. And there will probably be some form of a political Islamic party, not Hamas. <clears throat> but something that represents, just as there are Jewish religious parties, there could be an Islamic religious party as part of the Palestinian government. My own preference would be that there shouldn't be religious political parties, but that's the nature of our region, and, and we need to accept that. But we should not accept political parties that support armed struggles to be part of the political reality that develops after this war. First of all, I have to say, I'm, I'm really being surprised by how much you two actually agree or how much the, the points of view Anything, come huh? together. Arya, in those heady days before October 7th, our leaders made light of the need to grant Palestinian statehood in order to reach normalization, like with the Abraham Accords. I think we had some programs about it at the time. Has that perception changed in the last 109 days? No, what, what's changed is the United States of America and its perspective of leadership, and that's not 109 days. My math isn't so good, so I'll just tell you it's three years and two days since the administration changed from five peace deals in 123 days to one peace deal in the Middle East in the last three years and two days, which was brokered by China and between Saudi and Iran and all of the mess and the mayhem that you see around the region. When the United States of America leads then there's an opportunity for peace and prosperity. When the United States of America does not lead, we are not replaced by Costa Rica. We're replaced by China, Iran, and Russia. And what follows from that is the Houthis and Hezbollah and Hamas. And so therefore, yes, Israel can have lots of different thoughts in terms of how it can address peace in the Middle East. But let's also be very, very clear. Israel is able to succeed in bilateral relationships. When you want to talk about a trilateral relationship, that is capped based upon the superpower's vision. The superpower today, United States of America, has decided that the two-state solution is not a policy, but it is a religion. And therefore, based upon that religion, all decisions will be made based upon that. Iran will obviously do what they've continued to do, which is to normalize their behavior since they've been entered into the community of nations. My daughter also had a birthday recently, and she blew on candles and wished for something. I would argue that all three of those are fairly unlikely to happen, not because they didn't try very hard and blow on the candle, but because wishing something doesn't make it true. Iran needs to be pushed back. The terrorists need to be called terrorists and fought as though they are terrorists. And if there becomes a time where a people rise up who choose to be like a people who belong in the community of nations, be that the Palestinian leadership, or be that the, uh, the leaders in Iran, they should be welcomed like anybody else. Just imagine what the U.S. relationship was with Saudi Arabia just 23 years ago. And look where it is, should be today, and will be in the future. There are opportunities for change, but not because you lower the bar, because you raise the bar. Wishing things does not make things true. Uh, acting in a clear, decisive leadership fashion does. So Israel can decide whatever it wants. The United States of America, unfortunately, has placed a floor on progress in the region instead of setting a ceiling. Uh, Dr. Baskin, I want to come back to you going a slightly different direction because of your personal experience uh, from the Shalit hostage case. We've witnessed a first deal uh, in the release of 90 captives. That was back in November. Nothing new except several dead bodies for two months. Israel is ready to deal. We even came up with a proposal of sorts. The Qataris are still trying to mediate uh, minimally, what must happen to at least get hostage negotiations moving, or may, maybe there just won't be another deal? Yeah, an hour ago, Hamas announced that it rejected the Israeli proposal, so that's not good news. On the other hand, the good news is that Israel did make a proposal, and this is the first time that it has on the issue of hostages. So there is a door open to negotiate, but we have to understand 
Um, I've been negotiating with Hamas for 17 years, and what I've learned about them is that they say what they mean, and they mean what they say. And they put down, Arya used the, the term, a very high bar, and their very high bar is an end of the war, an Israeli withdrawal from Gaza, and an all-for-all hostages-prisoners deal, which is a very high bar, probably too high for the government of Israel to accept right now. What we have to understand is two things. One is that there is no way to bring back all the hostages alive, those who remain alive, and it's estimated <clears throat> of the 136 hostages that about 95 of them are alive. In order to bring them home alive and bring the bodies of the ones who are not, there has to be a negotiated agreement. There is no military way of bringing them home. There will be no Antepi. They are probably spread out, and the Hamas leadership is probably using them as human shields. In, the second thing that's important to recognize is that the war can wait. The hostages cannot. Israel has a moral responsibility to bring them home. Israel betrayed these people who were taken from their homes and taken from a music festival. They were betrayed by the government that failed to protect them, and the government has a moral responsibility to bring them home. Killing Sinwar and Mohammed Daif and Marwan Issa and all the others can wait. Finishing off Hamas can wait. We can take a break. We can agree to end the war and withdraw our troops. We can release all the prisoners and then re-arrest them, anyone that we choose. We did that in the past and we can do that in the future. So there is no such thing as a guarantee that Hamas might demand because no one can give Hamas a guarantee that Israel will not renew the war. Hamas will give us ample reasons to renew the war, and I'm sure that many of those prisoners will give ample reasons for them to be rearrested or killed. But first, we need to bring the hostages home. That's a tough message. Um, Arya, let me come back to you, and we're starting to run out of time, but I want to have at least one question for each of you that I've saved. Arya, some criticize the U.S. for somehow tying Israel's hands in this war. At the same time, the official word from Washington is that there is no call for a ceasefire. How, if at all, are Israel's hands being tied? Israel's fighting the war, not Washington. If we want to take Sir Philadelphia, we should have done it already. Well, you're, you're asking to get into the depths of the U.S.-Israel relationship, which I think is very important to be able to do, because I've seen it from the inside. I'll be very um, circumspect in terms of how I choose to answer this. Uh, the United States of America has many different levers that it can use to invoke various different responses from its friends and allies from the region. To me, I'll just highlight it as this has been a, a, a 110 days of contrast. President Biden coming during a war has been incredibly powerful and impactful and meaningful, and he should be thanked for doing that. The fact that Jordan, Egypt, and the PA would not meet with him when he was there was to me one of my most embarrassing days to be an American, uh, that right up there with the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. You can stand by Israel, but one of your goals of being the number one superpower ally of Israel is your ability to influence the region. If the PA Jordan and Egypt refused to meet with you based upon an obviously fake news story from the evening before that may have been contrived to have them avoid the meeting, to me that showed American weakness. So American strength unleashes Israel's ability to be able to do what it needs to do. America's weakness, perceived or real, hurts Israel desperately. And, and that's, again, perhaps not tying the hands. We can talk about that and resupplying munitions, etc. But at the end of the day, America standing tall and strong is the greatest thing that can happen for Israel. And it just hasn't done that as well as I think that it could. All right, Gershon, I want to come back to you one last time. Maybe this is the crux of the matter. Is there an opportunity here for Israel to eventually have something positive emerge from the U.S. gambit and of all the suffering that we've gone through clearly since October 7th? Or is it doomed to failure and disappointment like so many other previous initiatives? Look, it's really tough and it's really complex. But I think that one thing that we can be pretty sure of at this time is that at the end of the war, not too long after the end of the war, Israel will no longer be Bibi Stan. We will be rid of Benjamin Netanyahu and the ilks of, in Benjamin Netanyahu. There will be new elections in Israel and we will have a new government in Israel that is much more likely to entertain the possibility of actually having a genuine negotiation with the Palestinian people. 
I agree with Arya that we need to raise the bar on the Palestinians and demand for them much more credible behavior in terms of peacemaking. But we need to understand the fundamental principle that Israel will not have security unless the Palestinians have freedom and dignity, and the Palestinians will not have freedom and dignity unless Israel has security. There is a matching of interest between the Israeli people and the Palestinian people, and I think it comes at a time when the region is ready to play hardball with the Israelis and the Palestinians together in developing a regional architecture of stability, security, economic prosperity. I think it will involve it beyond the region as well as Europe and the United States and other powers. It's not going to be an Israeli-Palestinian bilateral process. That has not worked in the past. It won't work in the future. We need the support of the region first and the rest of the world to make it happen. And I think there is an opportunity here. Oh, we, have, we have another minute. I, I just would like to, to come back to you, Arya. Do you see a, a path forward that ends the war and is connected to the notion of, of Saudi normalization and Palestinian statehood? Or is that just a non-starter? A non oh, I think Israel will finish the war. I'm optimistic that Israel will be successful in executing most of its goals, if not all of its goals, in the war. And I'm 100% confident that Israel will make peace with Saudi Arabia. I don't think that making it on the wrong terms with the wrong motivations has any meaningful value. Israel has made it 76 years without peace with Saudi Arabia. If, God forbid, it needs to make it another 76 years, it can do the same thing. The region itself will be fundamentally stronger when the two countries get together for the correct purposes. When they get together and mix their messages and mix the incentives, you're then asking to go backwards without being able to go forwards. And that, to me, just seems nonsensical. Again, I'd like to live in a world where all of the nice sayings that exist on bumper stickers exist. And unfortunately, I live in a world of reality. And in that reality, you need to confront that reality meaningfully with realistic solutions that address real problems, October 7th being one of them. Uh, I, I will just make one more comment. Whether it's Prime Minister Netanyahu or anybody else, let's walk away with one moment of optimism. The young men and women that we've seen perform incredible acts of heroism, courage, and bravery since October 7th, have demonstrated that there's a new movement in Israel that hopefully all of the people, old people like Gershon and myself, will, will be worthy of living in their land at some point okay. in time because of the, the heroism and bravery that they've demonstrated. Amen. And let's all of us remember our fallen, and especially on such a tough day as we had today. Well, that's all the time yeah. we have for this evening. Thank you to our guests, Dr. Gershon Baskin and Arya Lightstone. For more of the latest from Israel, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter, ILTV.TV. I'm Steve Leibowitz. Thanks for watching. Let's win this war and bring them home.